we are increasingly aware of plant-derived substances that act as chemopreventive agents, substances that help prevent cancer, as opposed to chemotherapy substances aimed at treating cancer. These substances are not only inexpensive, easily, they're easily available, have no or limited toxicity. Now, since 1987, the National Cancer Institute has tested more than 1,000 different potential agents for chemopreventive activity, of which only a few dozen were moved to clinical trials. Curcumin, present in the Indian spice turmeric, which is used in curry powder, is one such agent that is currently under clinical investigation for cancer chemoprevention. According to their mode of action, chemopreventive agents are classified into different subgroups. There's the antiproliferatives, antioxidants, or carcinogen blockers. Curcumin belongs to all three, given its multiple mechanisms of action. Curcumin appears to play a role helping to block every stage of cancer transformation, proliferation, and invasion. It may even help before carcinogens even get to our cells. A study back in 87 investigated the effects of curcumin on the mutagenicity, the DNA mutating ability, of several toxins. And they found that curcumin was an effective anti-mutagen against several environmental and standard mutagenic and cancer-causing substances. But this was in vitro, uh, from the Latin meaning in glass, meaning in a test tube or petri dish. What about in people? Well, it's not like you can take a group of people and expose them to some nasty carcinogen just so you can give half of them turmeric and see what happens. Well, you could wait until some toxic waste spill happens or nuclear accident, but you know, otherwise you're not going to find people who would voluntarily expose themselves to carcinogens. Unless smokers. We can just test it on smokers. And they've got carcinogens coursing through their veins every day. If you take some smokers, have them pee on some bacteria, this is the number of DNA mutations that arise. Remember, all life is encoded by DNA, whether bacteria, banana, or bunny rabbit. It's easier, though, when measuring urinary mutagens to just pee on some bacteria. The urine of non-smokers caused far fewer DNA mutations. It makes sense. They have fewer toxins running through their system. And if you have the smokers eat turmeric for a month, Oh, excuse me, have the non-smokers eat turmeric for a month, nothing really happens. All right. What if you do the same for smokers, though? 15 days later, they're down to here. 30 days, they're down to here. Right. And this is not some concentrated curcumin supplement. This is just plain turmeric, like you'd buy at the store, and less than a teaspoon a day, indicating that dietary turmeric is an effective anti-mutagen. You'll note, though, on this graph, there's an even more effective anti-mutagen, not smoking. Even eating turmeric for a month, the DNA-damaging power of smoker pee exceeded that of non-smokers. Turmeric was originally cultivated in the Old World tropics, but now thrives in other tropical regions around the world. Turmeric has large dark green leaves that are erect and oblong. These leaves are pointed at the apex, broad near the base, and envelop the succeeding shoot. Turmeric is an herbaceous perennial plant of the ginger family and has bright orange rhizomes, which grow beneath the foliage. During the dry season, the stems and leaves dry up, and the rhizome remains dormant in the soil. Turmeric has a long history of being used for both food and medicine. It has been a major herb in Ayurvedic medicine for nearly 6,000 years. It has been used to purify the blood and to treat a number of illnesses, such as indigestion, liver and gallbladder diseases, arthritis, and rheumatism as well as colds and flu. Raw turmeric applied to the skin is effective in treating inflammations, infections, bruises, and sprains. Since the discovery of turmeric's antioxidant phenolic compounds and the protection that these compounds provide against free radicals, this spice is now viewed as much more than just a food colorant or yellow dye. 
Turmeric's potential use in cancer prevention and the treatment of HIV infections is now the subject of intense laboratory and clinical research. Using turmeric in your food is a good way to prevent health problems. A small quantity of raw grated turmeric adds taste to salad dressings and gives them a bright orange color. Curry, which is made from turmeric and ginger, is another excellent seasoning that provides preventative health care maintenance. Turmeric tea is also beneficial for the restoration of the liver and the gallbladder and aids in reducing inflammation and swelling and arthritis. Turmeric is easy to grow in the home garden and will produce sufficient quantities of roots for salad dressings, homemade curries, and medicinal use. You can use fresh roots from the markets for planting, or perhaps from your neighbors. Plant the roots superficially in the soil during April and May. Keep the area free of weeds during the following months, and later in the dry season, turmeric can be harvested for home use. The anti-cancer effects of the turmeric pigment curcumin extend well beyond its ability to block carcinogens. The anti-cancer effect of curcumin mainly results from the multitude of ways it regulates programmed cell death. It's estimated that the human body consists of 10 or so trillion cells. That's a million million. Almost all these cells get turned over within approximately 100 days. We're like a new person every three months. We reinvent ourselves physically. And since we're just made up of three things— air, water, and food— those are the only inputs. We are what we eat literally, physically. In a sense, our body has to rebuild itself every three months with the building materials we deliver to it through our stomach. Right? Our mouths are like the access road to the continual construction site to our body. Trucks roll in three times a day. What do we want them to deliver? Some shoddy, cheap stuff we scrounged around for or bought at the discount outlets that's just going to fall apart? Or do we want to build our foundation solid? Right? We are each walking around inside the greatest known architectural structures in the universe. Let's not ruin such grand blueprints by consuming junk. Anyway, we only own the biological real estate we're born with, so if we need to rebuild every three months, we also need a wrecking crew. Right? If we're replacing 10 trillion every 100 days, that means we have to kill off like 100 billion cells every day, normally, out with the old and with the new. We do that primarily through a process called apoptosis, pre-programmed cell death from the Greek ptosis meaning falling, and apo meaning away from. So it's our cells falling away from our body. For example, we all used to have webbed fingers and toes, literally each one of us in the womb until about four months. Then apoptosis kicks in, and the cells in the webbing between, in between kill themselves off to separate our fingers. Some cells in our body overstay their welcome, though, like cancer cells. They don't die when they're supposed to by somehow turning off their suicide genes. What can we do about it? Well, one of the ways curry kills cancer cells is by reprogramming the self-destruct mechanism back into cancer cells. Let me just run through one of these pathways. 
uh, just so you can see the complexity. FAST is a so-called death receptor, which activates the FAST-associated death domain, along with death receptor 5 and death receptor 4. FAD then activates caspase 8, which ignites the death machine and kills the cell. Where does curry powder fit into all this? In cancer cells, curcumin, the pigment in the spiced turmeric that makes curry powder yellow, upregulates and activates death receptors, as has been demonstrated in human kidney cancer cells, as well as skin cancer and nose and throat cancer. It can also activate the death machine directly, as has been shown in lung cancer and colon cancer. Caspases are so-called executioner enzymes that, when activated, destroy the cancer cell from within by chopping up proteins left and right, kind of death by a thousand cuts. And that's just one pathway. Here's all the other ways curcumin can affect apoptosis, and here's the, all the different types of cancer cells curcumin can kill. Uh, but it tends to leave normal cells alone, for reasons that are not fully understood. Overall, this review showed that the curcumin can kill a wide variety of tumor cell types through diverse mechanisms, and it's because curcumin can affect numerous mechanisms of cell death at the same time, it's possible that cancer cells may not easily develop resistance to curcumin-induced cell death, like they do to most chemotherapy. Furthermore, its ability to kill tumor cells and not normal cells makes curcumin an attractive candidate for supper. Can't make money on some spice you can buy anywhere an attractive candidate for drug development. The low incidence of large and small bowel cancer in India is often attributed to natural antioxidants such as curcumin in the diet, the yellow pigment in the spiced turmeric, which is used in curry powder. However, it's imperative to recall that beneficial effects attributed to diets are seldom reproduced by administration of a single ingredient in that diet. For example, you know, diets rich in beta-carotene lower the risk of tobacco-related cancers, but the administration of beta-carotene pills does not. That doesn't stop researchers from trying, though. Back in 2001, in a last-ditch attempt to save the lives of 15 patients with advanced colorectal cancer that didn't respond to any of the standard chemotherapy agents or radiation, they started them on a turmeric extract. It appeared to help stall the disease in a third of the patients, 5 out of 15, suggesting turmeric extract may cause clinical benefit in at least some patients with advanced refractory colorectal cancer. Now, if we were talking about some new kind of chemo, and it only helped one in three, you'd have to weigh that against chemo side effects— uh, losing your hair, sloughing of your gut, intractable vomiting, maybe being bedridden. So in a drug scenario, a one in three benefit may not sound particularly appealing, but when we're talking about a plant extract shown to be remarkably safe, even if it just helped 1 in 100, it'd be worth considering. With no serious downsides, a 1 in 3 benefit for end-stage cancer is pretty exciting. To see if colon cancer could be prevented, five years later researchers at the Cleveland Clinic and Hopkins tested two phytochemicals, uh, curcumin from, tur from turmeric, and quercetin found in red onions and red wine in people with familial adenomatous polyposis. Colon cancer forms from polyps, and there's this disease that runs in families in which you develop hundreds of polyps, which will eventually turn into cancer unless you have your colon prophylactically removed. So they took five such patients who already had their colons removed, but still either had their rectum or a little intestinal pouch, which were still packed with polyps. This is where they started out, between 5 and 45 polyps each, and this is where they ended up after six months of curcumin and quercetin supplements. On average, ended up with fewer than half the polyps, and the ones that they had shrunk in half. Here's a representative endoscopic photograph before and after. Kind of now you see it, now you don't. Uh, but what about patient one? Uh, 
got rid of all their polyps by month three, but then they seemed to come back. Uh, so they asked them what's what, and it turned out the patients stopped taking the supplements. Darn it, so they put them back on the phytonutrient supplements for another three months, and the polyps came back down all with virtually no adverse events and no blood test abnormalities. By studying people at high risk for colon cancer, they were able to show noticeable effects within just months. But polyposis is a rare disease. They were only able to recruit five people for the study. Thankfully, smokers are a dime a dozen. Another five years later, researchers put 44 smokers on turmeric curcumin supplements alone for a month, and measured changes in their colorectal aberrant crypt foci, which may act like precursors to polyps, which are the precursors to cancer. And we can see after just one month, there was a significant drop in the number of these aberrant crypt foci in the high-dose supplement group, but no change in the low-dose group, with no dose-limiting side effects, although the stools in the participants did turn yellow. Osteoarthritis is the most frequent cause of physical disability among older adults in the world, affecting more than 20 million Americans, with 20% of us destined to be affected in coming decades, and becoming more and more widespread among younger people as well. Osteoarthritis is characterized by loss of cartilage in the joint. We used to think it was just mechanical wear and tear, but is now generally accepted as an active joint disease with a prominent inflammatory component, as evidenced by, for example, significantly higher production of inflammatory prostaglandins from tissue samples obtained from the knees of people suffering from the disease. If the loss of cartilage is caused in part by inflammation, might an anti-inflammatory diet help, like it does with rheumatoid arthritis? Using optimal nutrition and exercise as the first-line intervention in the management of chronic osteoarthritis could well constitute the best medical practice. Where is the best science on what optimal nutrition might look like? The China study is a prime example showing the serious health consequences of high consumption of pro-inflammatory foods— meat, dairy, fat, and junk— and low consumption of anti-inflammatory plant foods— whole grains, vegetables, and fruits, and beans, and split peas, chickpeas, and lentils. The unnatural Western diet contributes to low-grade systemic inflammation and oxidative tissue stress and irritation, placing the immune system in an overactive state, a common denominator of conditions such as arthritis. There are phytonutrients in plants that appear to help decrease the degradation of the joint cartilage, the inflammatory activity, the cell death, and oxidative damage. This is based largely on in vitro studies, suggesting protective benefits of soy, and pomegranates, and citrus, and grapes, and green tea, and the curry powder spice turmeric. But my patients are people, not petri dishes. What role might the yellow pigment curcumin and turmeric play in the treatment of osteoarthritis? Well, you know, obesity doesn't just put stress on our joints. Fatty tissue inside our joints, like in the kneecap itself, is a source of pro-inflammatory chemicals that have been shown to increase cartilage degradation. Curcumin may not only help prevent the release of inflammatory chemicals, but slow the formation of the fat pad in the first place. But enough with test tubes. There have been two clinical studies published to date. The latest took 50 patients suffering from moderate to mild knee osteoarthritis and gave them either the best available medical treatment, which included control with anti-inflammatory drugs and painkillers, or the best available treatment along with some proprietary curcumin supplement. They looked at a number of different outcome measures, including the Karnofsky scale, which goes up to 100, which is normal, no complaints, no evidence of disease, down to zero, at which you're dead. The group with the added curcumin did significantly better, 
and were able to double their walking distance. This is the best medicine I had to offer, so Mother Nature made a counteroffer. The concumin group was able to significantly decrease their drug use, significantly fewer side effects, less swelling, hospitalizations, and other treatments. But it doesn't have to be some fancy proprietary formula. Here's the other study, the efficacy of turmeric extracts in patients with knee osteoarthritis. About 100 sufferers were randomized to ibuprofen or concentrated turmeric extracts for six weeks, and the curcumin group did as good or better than the ibuprofen. Even though ibuprofen is over-the-counter, it can cause ulceration, bleeding, and perforation of the stomach and intestines. It can eat right through our stomach wall, and in fact that happened to someone in the study. Whereas what are the side effects of curcumin? Potentially protecting against a long list of diseases. According to the World Health Organization, 80% of the Earth's inhabitants rely upon traditional medicines for their primary health care needs, in part due to the high cost of Western pharmaceuticals. Medicines derived from plants have played a pivotal role in the health care of both ancient and modern cultures. One of the prime sources of plant-derived medicines is spices. Turmeric is one such spice, known around the world by different names, my favorite of which is probably Zard Chubag. Turmeric is the dried powdered rootstocks of the turmeric plant, a member of the ginger family, from which the orange-yellow pigment curcumin can be extracted. The spice turmeric is what makes curry powder yellow, and curcumin is what makes turmeric yellow. The molecule even looks cool. I always thought it kind of looked like a crab. Anyways, in recent years, more than 5,000 articles have been published in the medical literature about curcumin. Many sport impressive-looking diagrams suggesting curcumin can benefit a multitude of conditions via a dizzying array of mechanisms. Curcumin was first isolated more than a century ago, but out of the thousands of experiments, just a handful in the 20th century were clinical studies involving actual human participants. But since the turn of the century, more than 50 clinical trials have been done, testing curcumin against a variety of human diseases, with 84 more clinical trials on the way. But most of the 5,000 were just in vitro lab studies, which I've resisted covering until they you know, moved more out of the petri dish and into the person. But this study got my attention. Rheumatoid arthritis is a chronic systemic inflammatory disorder that causes progressive destruction of the cartilage and bone of joints. The long-term prognosis of RA is poor, with as much as 80% of patients affected becoming disabled, with a reduction of years in life expectancy. There's lots of drugs one can take, but unfortunately they're often associated with severe side effects, including blood loss and bone loss and bone marrow suppression and toxicity to the liver and eyes. There's got to be a better way. Well, the efficacy of curcumin was first demonstrated over 30 years ago. A double-blind crossover study, curcumin versus phenylbutazone, a powerful anti-inflammatory drug they use in racehorses. Both drugs showed significant improvement in morning stiffness, walking time, joint swelling, with a complete absence of any side effects in the curcumin group, which is more than can be said for phenylbutazone, which was pulled from the market three years later for wiping out some people's immune systems and their lives. Here's the latest. 45 patients diagnosed with rheumatoid arthritis were randomized into three groups— curcumin, the standard of care drug, or both. The primary endpoint was a reduction in disease activity, as well as a reduction in joint tenderness and swelling. All three groups got better, 
But interestingly, the curcumin groups showed the highest percentage of improvement, significantly better than those in the drug group. The findings are significant, demonstrating that curcumin alone was not only safe and effective, but surprisingly more effective in alleviating pain compared to the leading drug of choice, all without any apparent adverse side effects. In fact, curcumin appeared protective, given that there were more adverse reactions in the drug group than the combined drug and curcumin group. In contrast to the non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, curcumin has no gastrointestinal side effects and may even protect the lining of the stomach. There are anti-inflammatory drugs that may reduce the risk of Alzheimer's disease, but stomach, liver, and kidney toxicity precludes their widespread use. So maybe using an anti-inflammatory food, like the spiced turmeric found in curry powder, could offer the benefits without the risks? Uh, before even considering putting it to the test, though, one might ask, well, do populations that eat a lot of turmeric have a lower prevalence of dementia? They may actually have the lowest reported prevalence of dementia in Alzheimer's. Okay, so far so good. But maybe because it's such an impoverished area that people just don't live very long. So you need to know more than just prevalence, how many Alzheimer's cases are walking around, but the incidence of the disease, how many new people are coming down with it every year, which reflects the kind of true rate of disease occurrence. In rural Pennsylvania, the incidence rate of Alzheimer's disease among seniors is 19. 19 people in 1,000 over age 65 develop Alzheimer's every year in rural Pennsylvania. In rural India, using the same diagnostic criteria, that same rate is 3, confirming they have among the lowest reported Alzheimer's rates in the world. Although there isn't much to go on, the lower prevalence of Alzheimer's in India is generally attributed to the turmeric consu consumption as part of curry, and it's assumed that people who use turmeric regularly have a lower incidence of the disease, but let's not just assume. A thousand people tested, and those who consume curry, at least occasionally, did do better on simple cognitive tests than those that didn't. Those that ate curry often had only about half the odds of showing cognitive impairment after adjusting for a wide variety of potential confounding factors. This suggests that curry consumption may be associated with better cognitive performance. Of course, it probably matters what's being curried. Are we talking chicken masala or chana masala, with chickpeas instead of chicks? It may be no coincidence that the country with the, among the lowest rates of Alzheimer's has among the lowest rates of meat consumption, with a significant chunk of the population eating meat-free and egg-free diets. We've known uh, for over 20 years now that those who eat meat, red meat or white meat, appear between two to three times more likely to become demented compared to vegetarians. And the longer one eats meat-free, the lower the associated risk of dementia, whether or not you curry favor with your brain. Pancreatic cancer is among the most aggressive forms of human cancer with a very high mortality rate. It represents the fourth leading cause of cancer death in the United States, with an annual mortality of 32,000 dead. With a five-year survival rate of only 3%, an average survival less than six months, diagnosis of pancreatic cancer carries one of the poorest prognoses. It's one of the worst things a doctor ever has to tell a patient. 
The only FDA-approved therapies for it, gemcitabine or lotinib, uh, produce objective responses in less than 10% of patients, while causing severe side effects in the majority. There's a desperate need for new options. Clinical research to test new treatments are split up into phases. Phase 1 trials are just to make sure the treatment is safe, to see how much you can give someone before it becomes toxic. Curcumin, the natural yellow pigment in the spice turmeric, has passed a number of those. In fact, there's so little toxicity that the dosing was limited only by the number of pills that patients were willing to swallow. Phase 2 is to see if it actually has any effect, and it did in two of the 21 advanced pancreatic cancer patients that were evaluated, one of whom had a 73% tumor reduction. This is what we'd like to see, before and after. Unfortunately, the effect was short-lived. This lesion remained small, but apparently a curcumin-resistant tumor clone emerged, whereas the other patient slow, showed a slow improvement over a year, stable disease for over 18 months. In fact, the only time their cancer markers bumped up was during a brief three-week stint where the curcumin was stopped. So it does seem to help some patients with pancreatic cancer, and most importantly, What's the downside? Right? No curcumin-related toxic effects, up to doses of 8 grams a day. Uh, what happens after 8? We don't know, because no one was willing to take that many pills. They were willing to go on one of the nastiest chemotherapy regimens on the planet, but didn't want to be inconvenienced with swallowing a lot of capsules. Anyway, the only surefire way to beat pancreatic cancer is to prevent it in the first place. In 2010, I profiled this study, the largest such study in history, which found that dietary fat of animal origin was associated with increased pancreatic cancer risk. But which animal fat is the worst? Well, the second largest study has since chimed in to help answer that question. Poultry was the worst. The first finding of its kind, 72% increased risk of pancreatic cancer for every 50 grams of daily poultry consumption. That's just like a quarter of a chicken breast. The reason white meat came out worse than red may be because of the cooked meat carcinogens in chicken, the, the heterocyclic amines that build up in grilled and baked chicken. These mutagenic chemicals have been associated with a doubling of pancreatic cancer risk. Other recent studies include one out of San Francisco, implicating the standard American diet, and one out of Italy. A high consumption of meat and other animal products, as well as refined carbs, was associated with pancreatic cancer risk, whereas a diet rich in fruit and vegetables appeared to lower risk. Eating meat may increase risk, whereas eating fake meat has been found associated with significantly less risk. Those who eat you know, plant-based meats, like veggie burgers and veggie dogs, three or more, more times a week had less than half the risk of fatal pancreatic cancer. Legumes and dried fruit were found to be similarly protective. This landmark study, comparing the ability of different spices to suppress inflammation, also compared their ability to protect DNA. Cloves, ginger, rosemary, and turmeric were able to significantly stifle the inflammatory response, but what about DNA protection? If you take a tissue sample from some random person, around 7% of their cells may show evidence of DNA damage, actual breaks in the strands of their DNA. And if you blast those cells with free radicals, you can bring that number up to 10%. But if the person had been eating ginger for a week, that drops to just 8%. This is from a tissue sample taken from someone who hadn't been eating any herbs and spices, and as a result their cells were vulnerable to DNA damage from oxidative stress. But just including ginger in our diet may cut that damage 25%, and same with rosemary. But check out turmeric. DNA damage cut in half. Again, this is not just mixing turmeric with cells in some petri dish. This is comparing what happens when you expose the cells of spice eaters versus the cells of non-spice eaters to free radicals, and just sit back and count DNA fracture rates. 
And not only did the turmeric work significantly better, but a significantly smaller dose. This is comparing about one and a third teaspoons a day of ginger or rosemary to practically just a pinch of turmeric, about an eighth of a teaspoon a day. That's how powerful the stuff is. So I encourage everyone to cook with this wonderful spice. Tastes great and may protect our cells and our body, with or without the added stress. If you just count DNA breaks in people's cells before and after a week of spices without the free radical blast, we see no significant intrinsic protection in the ginger or rosemary groups. But the turmeric groups still appear to reduce DNA damage by half. This may be because curcumin is not just itself an antioxidant, but boosts the activity of our own antioxidant enzymes. Catalase is one of the most active enzymes in the body. Each one can detoxify millions of free radicals per second. And if you consume the equivalent of about three quarters of a teaspoon of turmeric a day, the activity of this enzyme in our bloodstream gets boosted 75%. Now, why do I suggest cooking with it rather than just like throwing it in a smoothie? Well, this effect was found specifically for heat-treated turmeric. Uh, because in practice many herbs and spices are only consumed after cooking, they tested both turmeric and oregano in both raw and quote-unquote cooked forms. In terms of DNA damage, the results from raw turmeric did not reach statistical significance, though the opposite was found for the anti-inflammatory effects so maybe we should eat it both ways. Practical recommendations for obtaining curcumin in the diet might be to add turmeric to sweet dishes containing cinnamon and ginger. I add it to my pumpkin pie smoothies, which are otherwise just a can of pumpkin, uh, frozen cranberries, pitted dates, uh, pumpkin pie spice, and some non-dairy milk. And also you know, cook with curry powder or turmeric itself. They also suggest something called turmeric milk, which is evidently a traditional Indian elixir made with milk, turmeric powder, and sugar. I'd suggest substituting a healthier sweetener and a healthier milk. Soy milk, for example, might have a double benefit. If you're taking the turmeric to combat inflammation, compared to dairy protein, osteoarthritis sufferers randomized to soy protein ended up with significantly improved joint range of motion. Following flax and wheatgrass, turmeric is the third best-selling botanical dietary supplement, racking up $12 million in sales and increasing at a rate of about 20%. Curcumin is a natural plant product extracted from turmeric root, used commonly as a food additive, popular for its pleasant mild aroma and exotic yellow color, considered unlikely to cause side effects. Just because something is natural, though, doesn't necessarily mean it's not toxic. Strychnine is natural, cyanide is natural, lead, mercury, and plutonium are all elements. Can't get more natural than that. But uh, turmeric is just a plant. Plants can't be dangerous. Tell that to Socrates. In considering the validity of the widely accepted notion that complementary and alternative medicine is a safer approach to therapy, we must remind ourselves and our patients that a therapy that exerts a biological effect is, by definition, a drug and can have toxicity. It cannot be assumed that diet-derived agents will be innocuous when administered as pharmaceutical formulations at doses likely to exceed those consumed in the diet. Traditional Indian diets may include as much as a teaspoon of turmeric a day, which is the equivalent of about mm, this much fresh turmeric root. If you look at the doses of turmeric that have been used in human studies, they range from less than a sixteenth of a teaspoon a day up to about two tablespoons a day for over a month, whereas the curcumin trials have used up to the amount found in cups of the spice around a hundred times more than what curry lovers have been eating for centuries. Still without overt serious side effects in the short term at least, but if you combine both high-dose curcumin with black pepper for that 2,000% bioavailability boost, 
That could be like consuming the equivalent of 29 cups of turmeric a day. That kind of intake could bring peak blood levels up around here, where you start seeing some significant DNA damage, in vitro at least. So just incorporating turmeric into our cooking may be better than taking curcumin supplements, particularly during pregnancy. The only other contraindication uh, cited in the most recent review was the potential to trigger gallbladder pain in people with gallstones. If anything, curcumin may help protect liver function and help prevent gallstones by acting as a cholecystokinetic agent, meaning it facilitates the pumping action of the gallbladder to keep the bile from stagnating. In this study, they gave people a small dose of curcumin, about the amount found like a quarter teaspoon of turmeric, and using ultrasound were able to visualize the gallbladder squeezing down in response, with an average change in volume about 29%. Optimally, though, you'd want to like squeeze it in half, so they repeated the experiment with different doses, and it took about 40 mg to get a 50% contraction. That's about a third of a teaspoon of turmeric every day. On one hand, that's great, totally doable. But on the other hand, I'm thinking, wow, that's some incredibly powerful stuff. Uh, what if you had a gallbladder obstruction? If you had a stone blocking your bile duct, and you eat something like that that makes your gallbladder squeeze down that hard, well, it could hurt. You know? So patients with biliary tract obstruction should be careful about consuming curcumin. But for everybody else, these results suggest that curcumin can effectively induce the gallbladder to empty, and thereby you know, reduce the risk of gallstone formation in the first place, and ultimately perhaps even gallbladder cancer. Too much turmeric, though, may increase the risk of kidney stones. As I mentioned in a previous video, uh, turmeric is high in soluble oxalates, which combine to calcium form insoluble calcium oxalate, which is responsible for approximately three-quarters of all kidney stones. So the consumption of even moderate amounts of turmeric would not be recommended for people with a tendency to form kidney stones. Such folks should restrict the consumption of total dietary oxalate to less than 40-50 mg a day, which means no more than at most a teaspoon of turmeric. So for example, those with gout are by definition, it appears, at high risk for kidney stones. And so if their doctor wanted to treat gout inflammation with high-dose turmeric, then that's where curcumin supplements might come into play, because to reach you know, high levels of curcumin in turmeric form would incur too much of an oxalate load. If one is prescribed a supplement, how do you choose? Uh, the latest review recommends purchasing from Western suppliers that follow recommended good manufacturing practices, which may decrease the likelihood of our buying a, an adulterated product.